Excellent. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the July Insights and Learning session. Uh, this time we're going to be focusing on how we're using triage to prioritize um, needs. So, um, firstly, to kick us off, I am just going to run through a little bit about the terminology and language that we use around triage because it's used a multitude of ways across the community and um, generally is a coverall term for that initial assessment of legal needs and client capabilities when users present a service. And this can be done in an online remote way or it can be done in a face-to-face -face way or in a hybrid or blended way. Um, we are going to be exploring a number of different triage delivery models in the session today. Um, and our focus will really be on investigating the extent to which these different models can be used to prioritize the need presented at our service doors. We know that frontline, resource, uh, frontline services are under-resourced and oversubscribed. We have more users in need than we have support available. And we really want to use this session to explore what role triage models can play in ensuring frontline services are directing the resources that they do have to the users experiencing the greatest needs, disadvantages, or barriers in accessing services. Um, as I've mentioned, and as always, our time in these sessions is limited. So there's gonna be a couple of topics that are related to um, the topic of triage that we won't have time to discuss today. Um, for example, we know a lot of triage work results in the signposting and referral of users to other services, um, whether that's due to issues around suitability or capacity. Um, we recognise that that closely aligns to what we're talking about today. So we're aiming to cover that topic around signposting and referral models at our next Insights and Learning session, which will be in October. So we're going to hold over that discussion from today to our next session. Um, this session will also not be exploring the optimum level of experience or expertise of staff and volunteers conducting triage. I know this is somewhat of a hot topic and when we shared the details on this session, we had a number of people feeding back differing views on that issue specifically. As always, I'm always keen to hear your thoughts from your own experiences on what level of expertise or experience produces the best triage results. We won't have time to discuss it in very great depth today, but if you do think that is something that it would be worth hashing out, let us know and we can always facilitate a specific session to air that out in greater detail. So yeah, a little bit of context there, um, but I think um, enough from me. Um, I want us to jump straight into looking at the different triage delivery models that we are aware of that exist um, and to help give us an overview. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome Rosa Coleman from the London Legal Support Trust, who's gonna be looking at the models of triage being deployed by frontline organizations through their cost of living partnership project in London. So Rosa, over to you. So, so just a little bit of context um, for the project that we've been running. So firstly, hi everyone, good morning. Um, I'm Rosa from London Legal Support Trust. And one of the projects that we're currently working on is a strategic partnership between um, ourselves, London Systems Advice, and using funding from the Greater London Authority, as well as getting some strategic support from them as well. So it's a 12 month project um, with organisations uh, beginning delivery from September 2022, so almost at the end of that 12 month period. The aim of the project was to try and bolster the support and advice available to Londoners who were experiencing problems caused or exacerbated by the growing cost of living crisis. So in its very simplest form, it tried to achieve this by funding advice agencies and some community organisations to employ staff to deliver advice services and work in partnership locally to try and meet as much need from their communities as possible. Um, and outside of the delivery side of the partnership, the project also enabled conversations between London System of Advice, London Legal Support Trust and the GLA with other funders, membership bodies and other key stakeholders about various sector-wide issues, including data collection, 
language use, generalist, specialist, all of those other tricky topics, um, and workforce issues too. So it's been quite a broad project, um, but I'll try and focus today just on the kind of triage side bit. I think that will be the most helpful. So the role of triage in this project um, has been quite central to it, to be honest. So we've come to this project with the understanding that the cost of living crisis has amplified existing issues that people were already facing. Um, and triage seems like a really good way of trying to meet some of those issues kind of where they are. So, for example, we're, we've seen and we expected a significant increase in urgent needs. So service users are presenting in a much more desperate state, needing really immediate, urgent, critical support. Um, we also expected a trend that we saw emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic that many people would be experiencing problems for the very first time and they might need support um, both to identify that they have a legal issue and then also support to resolve that issue. Um, and there was also a concern that vulnerable groups or those particularly at risk or in need may not be able to access services either where they moved remotely throughout COVID or just historically where those groups hadn't particularly engaged locally with services. So, under the staffing of this project, um, there's a whole range of models being used um, because there are 21 organisations, Pan London being funded by London Legal Support Trust, and then there are 18 partners being funded by London Citizens Advice. So from our side of the project specifically, the roles that directly relate to triage um, have a nice variety of titles, um, which I think really reflects the variety that triage can be. Um, so we've got crisis navigators, cost of living support navigators, triage officers, and we also have three apprentices under this project who are undertaking their um, SQEs. So having a dedicated staff member for the work, we found that has meant that they can provide more targeted outreach, um, for example, in locations where their organisation may not have worked before. Um, but also, really importantly, they're a key point of contact for service users coming to the organisation directly or being referred in from elsewhere. So the SQE apprentices especially we found have been really effective at outreach into new boroughs and areas. That seems to be anecdotally just because they have a bit more capacity in their day-to-day -day work schedule to be able to invest in those partnerships and invest in doing that outreach work. Um, but all of these roles, they help assess the needs of the client when they first interact with them. Um, they can help resolve their initial issues, so address those basic needs around support accessing food bank launches or something really central to their well-being. And then the user can deal with other more complex issues when they're being referred to the relevant either staff member within the organisation or if they're being referred across organisations. So, for example, um, a triage or crisis prevention advisor at London Citizens Advice may refer a specialist housing case to the LLST funded housing supervisor somewhere else. Similarly, the LLST triage um, navigator may refer someone that needs some debt advice to their local citizens advice. So it just depends on, on the need of the client. The other area that we've got um, some of these roles based is within those three funded community organisations themselves. So that's enabled them to work closely with their local organisations to refer and pass on um, their service users who might need a bit more support. So the whole idea of this project obviously is to try and reach those who are facing crisis and reach those most in need and to try and mitigate some of the impacts of the cost of living crisis. So the key ways that, um, that we've tried to address that is firstly by advice type. So we've all seen and anyone in service will have seen the increases in cost of living related issues around housing, debt and welfare benefits, especially and um, energy as well. So triaging has allowed those issues to be identified and referred to the most suitable support as quickly as possible. Um, so because this is a partnership project, with local relationships, it means that citizens advice and LST funded advice agencies have been able to work together informally in a lot of boroughs as well to provide um, ad hoc training for each other. For example, a legal aid housing solicitor from 
uh, a law centre that we're funding goes into their local citizens' advice every couple of months to give her a little half hour of pressure to the staff about what a legal aid housing case might look like, which means if a client has entered that, they're able to identify that relatively quickly and pass it straight over so that they can be supported as quickly as possible. Um, the other area is geographic location. So we know that sadly there are both deserts in London, especially in the outer boroughs. So the funding under this project was strategically to try and target some of those areas that were really lacking, um, either lacking any provision or lacking, lacking specifically specialist legal services. Um, this tends to often be a triaging or outreach worker role in that there'll be physical outreach from the advice agency to either another organisation within the borough, to a neighbouring borough, or where they're offering virtual support. It might be that they have um, a portal that they're letting anyone send their referrals through to. So that might be Pan London, um, depending on when they have capacity, obviously. And then uh, the third way that we've really tried to target those in particular need is through looking at the organisation type. So um, we've provided, obviously, it's on a relatively small scale in relation to the total number of organisations funded under this project. But we've specifically funded um, organisations who are already working with who might not traditionally access advice services. Um, these three funded community partners have, uh, as I said earlier, have their own triage staff member, um, which has really helped them build that local connection to advice services and tap into that kind of broader network of advice provision around them. Um, and then on the London Citizens Advice side, they're providing, so I shouldn't have used acronyms here, this is not particularly helpful, is it? Um, on the London Citizens Advice side, they've provided advice first aid training for um, community groups who want to access it, which has allowed them to be upskilled, empowered local groups to support service users directly, but also help them play more of that role in identifying where someone may have a legal need that otherwise may not be addressed. And then finally, this is a very basic map of what the most basic delivery model would look like for this partnership working. So we have a funded London Citizens Advice, we have a funded LLST advice agency, which traditionally is one of our centres of excellence, so that's a, uh, a specialist free legal advice agency. And then we have a community organisation. And the idea is that the support is able to go between all of them, the key focus here is between the citizens' advice and the um, LLST funded organisation, primarily for resourcing. Obviously, if we had more resourcing, we would hope that this community organisation would be able to have more resource, be able to do more of their own outreach work where needed, um, and provide a lot more support back to the other organisations. The roles in this tend to be that, as I said, a triage worker would fit in both or hopefully all three of these organisations, um, but primarily within the Citizens Advice and the LST funded advice agency. Um, and then the outreach to the community organisation may be um, either directing the community organisation or it may be taking part um, taking place somewhere else relevant. So it could be a local faith group, a youth centre in schools. We've seen a lot of outreach happening. It's been really productive. Um, people in courts, helping people just before they're going into the hearings um, and at food banks too, to really target the most vulnerable populations where they're already showing up for support or a different type of, um, of assistance. Um, the, the main thing I'd say that we found with these delivery model approaches is that the role of triage has really been critical especially when it's partnering in a brand new borough where we haven't got or there's no existing um, advice provision of, of the type that's needed. So co-designing this project with delivery partners based on where they identified the resource could be best used to tackle these cost of living specific issues has been really key. Um, yeah, so that, that's the end of my slides. I hope I've kept the time for you, Martha. Before we go into the next part of the session, I'll just briefly introduce myself. My name is Jaira Kanbanaho, and I'm a grant officer at the Access to Justice Foundation. 
I will just briefly be speaking about triage at the point of, you know, um, from the frontline organizations and what we have seen as a funder, because we are very keen to understand how frontline organizations, especially the organizations that we support, identify and prioritize needs and how effective they are in doing this to ensure that their services are accessible by those that need them the most. This is a key question for us to understand, as for reasons mentioned earlier by Martha, such as the lack of enough resources and the increasing demand and need at the front line. Therefore, it's important for us to see that organizations are taking steps to be able to reach people with their services, the people that need it the most. Our analysis of uh, data and information received from grantees, applicants, and other organizations at the front line, we have come to understand that there are several models of being used for triage of delivery. Uh, we also just highlighted some of them being used in their project here in London. And as a national funder, we are able to see that there are several similarities across the country, especially where users have a first point of contact through either a triage officer or whether it's similar role under a different name or through outreaches, especially in more rural areas where there is an active need to reach out to organizations or to people that need to access these services the most and are not able to for whatever reason. To cover this and more, we'll shortly be hearing from some of the frontline organizations who have interesting triage models that they're currently using. This is to enable us to have a closer look to what this actually looks like in practice and what they're implementing and any issues they're facing along the way. Um, firstly, I would like to welcome Lucy Valentine, who is the Deputy CEO of North Yorkshire Citizens Advice and Law Centre. She'll be sharing more with us about their telephone advice line and their team triage. Over to you, Lucy. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much to the Access to Justice Foundation for giving us the opportunity to just share a little bit about what works for us in terms of triage and uh, managing our demand. Um, I did think it would be useful to just give a very, hopefully very quick overview of our organisation before talking about how we triage, um, just so you've got an idea of our size, our scope of service and our geographical cover. Um, so 10 years ago, North Yorkshire had eight local citizens advice offices with each office being an independent charity. And then over the past 10 years, there have been five mergers, the last one happening in April last year, which finally brought together all the local citizens advice in North Yorkshire together as one organisation. And then towards the end of last year, we set up our law centre and now we are officially North Yorkshire Citizens Advice and Law Centre. Um, so that brings us quite a bit of size. We've got about 125 staff and about 135 volunteers. Some are based in one or more of our offices and some are hybrid workers. Some are completely remote workers and we've staff as far south as Brighton and as far north as Edinburgh. Um, and the bulk of our service we deliver is for people in North Yorkshire, which is the largest county in England by area. Um, last year, we helped around 22,000 people with over 104,000 issues and frequently um, our clients, uh, as everyone's present with more than one issue, but our top issues are welfare benefits, energy related issues, which did make the top two last year for the first time, debt and money, uh, housing and employment. Um, and our generalist advisors are, are a mixture of paid staff and volunteers, and they deal with all topics of advice. And then we have our specialist teams receiving referrals for expert help in housing, debt, benefits, energy, family law, discrimination and immigration and asylum. So uh, our main channels of access are face-to-face -face and telephone and online, but to make the best use of our resources, we do tend to direct people who can use the phone to make contact via our free advice line, if, if at all possible. And that is where we do the bulk of our triage because it's open five days a week, nine to five, and allows us to uh, make sure that our time-limited face-to-face drop-ins can be protected for those who need it most. Um, maybe they've got a vulnerability um, and making in-person contact the most appropriate for them. Um, all of our eight offices have advertised drop-in sessions with the number of sessions determined by local demand. So for example, Selby and Scarborough are open much more than Skipton and Richmond. And we've also got two outreach vehicles, a van and what we like to call a bus, uh, where face-to-face -face access to the service can be offered. Um, but we've got a pretty large team covering our advice line. There's um, 20 paid staff and 26 volunteers and all of those people are paid uh, are um, part-time. So it equates to about 12 and a half full-time equivalent paid and just over two full-time equivalent for volunteers. 
um, and with adjustments to annual leave and covering other services where necessary, for example, um, the face-to-face drop-in, sickness absence and so on, we do aim to have a minimum of 10 people logged in to answer the phone at all times, which allows us to do our triage. Um, so anyone in the meeting that works for Citizens Advice, particularly those who have been around for a very long time, will know that every few years we're encouraged to completely remodel how we triage. Um, over the years, I've known it to be called diagnostic reception, gateway, initial check and a number of other things. But essentially, we are applying a filter to make the very most of the resources that we've uh, that we've got. Um, and directing people who just need the knowledge and tools to make their own way forward um, appropriately, delivering full advice where it's needed and then taking up casework for the people who've either got the most complex inquiries or the most complex needs. Um, and we also ensure that if we've got a funded project, uh, clients can reach that at the earliest opportunity. Um, and because our um, advice service is holistic, we are constantly balancing quality with quantity and striving to help as many people as possible across the uh, service. So uh, whilst we're also making sure that we're dealing with all those underlying issues and the cause of need, as well as the presenting problem. Um, so the triage is carried out by the frontline advisors at the first point of contact from the client, uh, with the majority of this being on the advice line and the rest at the drop-in sessions. Um, we work to an advice framework, which means generally and ideally the client is taken as far as they can be with their inquiry on that first contact with us. But we do take a flexible approach with this uh, and look at what's best for the client. Um, that's always at the core of what our next steps decision uh, is um, and what the, all the advisors will do on that first contact, regardless of their level ex of experience, is take the client's details, check if they've used the service before and if so, whether their inquiry is about an existing case or a new matter and they will record everything on our case management system. Um, they'll also record or update all of the consents that we hold along with checking the contact details and recording profile information before moving on to ask how we can help. And we encourage all the advisors, regardless of their experience, to use our essential information questions booklet when exploring the advice issue, as it ensures that we capture all the crucial information about key dates, deadlines, prompting to consider if there's been any discrimination and so on. And it's particularly useful for new advisors that it does keep them on track. And at that exploration uh, stage, we'll also check the client's capability including whether they've got internet access uh, and whether they're comfortable using it. Um, if they've maybe got any support from family or friends or a support worker, and we'll check if language line is needed or if there's any other additional needs. Or crucially, for all those people who ring up just to book an appointment, we'll check if they really need to see someone in person or if after an explanation of how we can help them over the phone uh, and explain how much quicker it will be um, for that to happen, whether telephone advice is, um, is suitable for them. But then our main um, uh, method of uh, triaging uh, for next step is using um, what we call task lists. Um, so we use task lists as an alternative to booked appointments. If the issue is reasonably straightforward, the advice uh, will be researched and given there and then on the first contact. Um, and that's the advantage of using generalist advisors for us for our triage. Um, but then we have a number of task lists that referrals can be made to, which are split by team. For example, generalist uh, for the cases that are not complex, but they might be time consuming or for which we don't have a specialist funded team. And then we have housing, debt, energy benefits and so on with all our other specialist areas. Um, we'll keep a close eye on time. So sometimes a referral will made simply because there's a, a queue either in the waiting room or on the phones. Um, and it's not that the first advisor couldn't answer the question, but because it would take them too long. Um, so especially if there were multiple issues um, and we can transfer a case to more than one task list. For example, the energy team might pick up income maximisation uh, while the housing team pick up their part. And the first advisor might want a caseworker to just cast an eye and check that nothing's been missed. So in which case they can transfer the case record to a task list and mark it for review. So these are very quick for our caseworkers to uh, progress through. But if the issue is complex, the advisor will deal with all the emergencies at the first point of contact and then transfer to the task list and mark it as a referral, which will then be assigned to a caseworker. Um, we use our advice session supervisors to help the advisors decide at what point a case should be referred. 
Um, there's a constant balancing of resources depending on demand uh, with the goal of providing a consistent service for everyone. And I sometimes describe the need to provide a sort of silver star service for most people rather than providing a gold star service for the very minority of people. So obviously we want a gold star service for all, but if you start off with that, then the first person on the line or the first person through the door um, gets all the service and then you're faced with turning people away or maybe missing deadlines. Um, we use a service manager on duty to oversee the allocation of work and move cases around to the appropriate specialist task list. And they also have flexibility to override any closed task list if necessary. So for example, if there was a project specific issue um, that needed to reach a particular advisor, they would be able to do that. Um, the specialist team leaders will keep the service manager on duty informed about absence and capacity. So, for example, some days they may be able to take six housing referrals, but another day only two. And the duty manager will keep an eye on deadlines and help the specialist teams by prioritising the referrals. So if there's capacity for six, they will get six because there's never a shortage of work. Uh, but if there was absence and a generalist uh, volunteer perhaps could at least make a start, then the case would be allocated to the generalist advisor and then sent through for review afterwards. Um, and things that are always dealt with on the first contact are any emergencies, including any safeguarding concerns. Um, and we also check for any conflicts of issue at this point. And depending on the inquiry, we might at that point establish if the client would be eligible for legal aid. Um, so this our model has evolved over time and I would describe it as very flexible. So when I first joined the service, we used a model where everyone was advised in full at first contact, regardless of their query. It just led to lengthy queues and appointments that were backed up for weeks and weeks. Um, and then there have been times when we've stopped the at the exploration stage uh, and all clients at that point would either be signposted or booked an appointment with either a generalist or a specialist advisor. Um, but that meant that um, everyone who needed advice would have at least two contacts and there was a risk that quick advice would be given during that 10 minute triage to avoid the, you know, wasting a valuable, valuable appointment. But um, we found that quick advice is, is really good advice. Um, so how we currently work feels like there's a good balance. And if an advisor would learn from giving advice and there's plenty of phone cover, they can take that inquiry further. Uh, but on another day, they might just need to do a referral, spend a day on the generalist task list to get the same learning time. Um, and then some of our uh, challenges that we've encountered are making the actual switch to using the task lists from having booked appointments. Um, you do have to just pick a date and go for it um, and uh, dealing with it in a similar way to if a worker was on extended lead. And it, and it is difficult to do it, but it is only for a very short period. And this model has worked very well for us in managing the demand and also getting the uh, correct referrals to the appropriate specialist team. Um, we find it needs to be consistent. It can't de really depend on the day or the advisor who answered the phone as to what level of service a client gets. Um, but training all our advisors to the same standard and keeping an eye on time helps us address this. Um, but it is a challenge with such a diverse team located across um, separate offices. And um, the quality of the referrals, the generalist service can sometimes do a little bit too much instead of referring where there's capacity and getting on with taking another incoming call. Um, or they can sometimes do too little before making the referral. Um, and it can be a little bit confusing for them to understand the scope of what's, ex what's expected from them. But a steer from the session supervisor helps with this. Um, and, um, and that's how we control that. Uh, yes. And of course, the main the demand, the main challenge is demand. The task lists can be limited, so only the number of referrals that a specialist team can deal with are transferred. But there's always more clients than slots, so we are constantly prioritising. But we find that good communication between the team leaders and the generalist service manager really helps. And that's to jump in, Lacey, just to keep uh, the time. Um, that's, me, yeah. that's me done. <laughs> yeah, so if in case there's anything else that we would like to add, we'll include that in the meeting notes and add anything else you'd like to add. But thank you so much for um, that explanation and for letting us know about your model. The next model, we're going to be going into the one which identifies and prioritizes based on risk. For this section, I'd like to invite Sue Dunn, who is the CEO of Domestic Abuse Volunteer Support Services. She will talk about the Safe Lives Checklist. So over to you, Sue. Good morning, everyone, and um, a really big thank you to the um, Access to Justice Foundation for inviting us uh, along today. It's really um, a good raising awareness session, and domestic abuse really does need a lot of that. 
Um, yes, I'm from DAVS, Domestic Abuse Volunteer Support Service. Um, I can say we are very, very proud to have received the Queen's Award for volunteering. And, and that really does highlight the amazing, uh, well, an amazing accolade really to our exceptional volunteers um, and staff. So today I'm going to be um, introducing you to Dash, Annalene, if I could have the first, the second slide, please. Okay. So I'm going to be introducing you to uh, what is commonly known as Dash. And this stands for Domestic Abuse, Stalking and Honor-Based Violence. Um, and you can see there's three big words there, really, the domestic abuse, stalking, HBV, honor-based violence. And these, these are all high-risk indicators in um, the domestic abuse world. Thank you, Alani. So it's important that we actually put some context into um, why we need a risk indicator checklist. And I thought it was important I give you some um, statistics around this um, because it is so prevalent in our society today, domestic abuse. Um, end of March 2020, 2021, there are 1.6 million women and 750,000 uh, men uh, were subject to domestic abuse. Again, it in, uh, involves men and women as victims. Two women are killed every week in the UK. Uh, owing to domestic abuse at the hands of their partners or ex-partners. So whilst we sit here today, I, can, I know there will be two women killed next week. We just don't know their names yet. And that is a sad reality around domestic abuse. We know that domestic abuse is more likely to result in injury than any other types of assault. And it carries the highest repeat victimization rate than any other crime. So police know they are going to be attending incidents on a number of occasions. During some research, it was very much identified that 94% of murders uh, of uh, victims of DA stalking is a precursor to the murder. So stalking tells us this is a high risk case if stalking has begun. We know that domestic abuse is a volume cr crime. It accounts for a quarter of all recorded crime across the UK. And we also know that um, the dash I'm about to talk to you now is actually now commonly used um, across the UK, which is really good news. So why do we need um, a risk indicator checklist known as, as the dash? And how did that actually come about? Well, one of the big problems we were having is that um, in the early days of working with domestic abuse, different agencies were coming up with their own risk assessment. So when we eventually did sit round a table to look at risk, we were all coming from it at different angles. And this was a real problem. Um, and at the same time, um, there was a profile of DA occurring. Next slide, please, Annaline. And this profile uh, was looking at 56 specific domestic abuse murders, uh, 400 serious domestic violence offences, was looking at uh, these high numbers around sexual offences, 104 al allegations. And what this clearly highlighted at the same time where all local agencies were saying, look, we need to do something here. This was um, also going on at the same time, which um, was quite amazing how it came together. And this literature uh, review and consultations and this whole profile was done by a lady by the name of uh, Laura Richards together with a, um, she was a behavioural um, criminal behaviourist and also uh, the Met Police and also um, an organisation that was then known as CADA, which is Coordinated Action Against Domestic Abuse, but it, that is now known as Safe Lives. And basically what they um, identified from this profiling, next slide, was that they identified 16 high risk indicators that allowed us to say, look, if these indicators are apparent, then are prevalent, this case is high risk. So now when we actually look at training, we focus on these high risk indicators, because these are all prevalent 
leading up to a domestic abuse murder. So if I, I can't go through each one of these with you today, but if I was to say to you, I'll pull out a few of these to help you understand why these are high risk indicators for domestic abuse. So when we look at separation, for example, all domestic abuse murders occur at the point of separation or within three months of it. Now, there's a whole background and learning behind that, but anyone looking at risk would immediately say, is this person looking to leave? Have they left? Does the perpetrator know they're leaving? That would immediately be telling us separation. This is a concerning time because that's when the murder will take place. When we look at um, honor-based violence, HBV, um, honor-based violence uh, is always high risk. It's very complex. And of course, this is uh, something that happens um, uh, well, that is perceived to bring dishonor to the family unit. And there are a number of things behind that. Forced marriage, female genital, female genitalation, for example, would be part of that. And then you've got stalking. Um, nine out of 10 women who were murdered are stalked prior to their, um, through the, to, through their, before their actual murder, they are stalked. So this gives us again an indication um, that this is high risk and strangulation is a common way of murdering particularly women in domestic abuse cases. So this is something that we as a domestic abuse service have to be fully trained on and no one should ever complete the dash without having the training because it must never ever be a tick box scenario. But having the dash allows us to triage our work and focus on those that we identify as the most at risk and make sure um, all the early intervention strategies that we can put in place are put in place. And ultimately, what we hope to do, next slide, is of course, actually save life. This is what it's all about. Because if we can identify the risk for victims, we can put those strategy strategies in place and hopefully save that life. Of course, domestic abuse agencies will never know which ones they've saved, but we know we do, uh, without a doubt. So this sole purpose of the uh, risk indicator checklist, the DASH, is about um, saving, saving lives and enabling agencies to actually put measures in place once the level of risk has been identified. Next slide, please. So when we look at the dash, what it actually contains is 24 questions all around those 16 high risk indicators. And also I, I can advise you um, prior to the introduction of the dash model, um, victims, um, there was lots of work with victims to say, well, how should these questions be posed? So they informed the actual process for the introduction of the DASH. And the 24 questions are predominantly around all those high risk indicators. Um, police actually use 27 questions as more in there around um, child protection in relation to the, the, the police questions. And what this actually gives us is a set of what we would call intelligent questions about what's going on in order for us to identify that risk and be able to say, these are the risks we've identified. What actions can we put in place to either reduce that risk or remove the risk or manage the risk? That's where we're coming from when we're looking at these. Now, I can tell you every agency predominantly working with families will be using this and you know, predominantly police use it. We know social services will use it. Um, some housing services use it because they will have appointed within their organizations those people who are specifically trained to uh, look at risk when dealing with those families where there's disclosures or concerns regarding um, domestic abuse. And of course, um, it, the important thing here is about recording all our actions. So having assessed risk, there will be a full and thorough safety plan put in place. And that is continually monitored. As this last bullet point says, you know, this must remain dy dynamic because risk changes. 
And you may have noted on the previous slide that pregnancy was one of the high risk indicators. Now, you could have a situation where you've been assessing risk and then there's no information that um, our client, our victim may actually be pregnant. That increases risk because 30 percent of all domestic violence begins at the point of pregnancy. So you have to have an understanding of what it means behind those risk that those 16 high risk indicators. No one should ever do the dash that isn't fully trained to understand what risk means here. Next slide, please. So once we've done it, it actually gives us some indication of um, the risk level. Every client um, it, within a domestic abuse service will be risk assessed, always. Every client. And we have these categories, standard, uh, medium and high. Uh, standard is, well, you know, there's there's maybe some, but there's no, no specific high risk indicators there. So we will do some work um, with that individual because obviously part of the domestic abuse services, um, if they're dealing with all risks, some current domestic abuse services may only deal with high risk clients, is, is also about prevention. We want to prevent it getting to the more serious case. Within um, domestic abuse uh, volunteer support service, we support all victims of um, domestic abuse, regardless of their risk level, because you will have people in the medium risk that might want a non-molestation order, they might want um, a restraining order, and we would assist them to obtain those as part of what, what is the safety planning. And of course, the high risk there basically is telling us that there are identifiable indicators of risk here that are likely to cause uh, serious harm. And out of those 24 questions, if the person was to score 14 as a yes within those, that means it is specifically high risk, which then means, um, if we could look at the next slide, it would actually go to a multi-agency risk assessment conference. Because to enable to reduce risk or deal with risk, we have to know everything about what risks are, are, are there, what are present. And no one agency should deal with risk on their own. That's not good for the agency. It's not good for the, uh, for the victim either. Predominantly, it's not the best for the victim. Because by having agencies around the table, we can share information. We can know the full risk. And at that multi-agency meeting, we can then implement a full safety plan to support that uh, individual. And this is about identifying further risk, information share, get this whole holistic picture of risk and target all those variables within this um, multi-agency risk management plan. And sharing that information is really that a real priority when you're looking at domestic abuse because not one agency can deal with it. Victims need housing, victims need legal advice, they need support to court. Um, there's a whole wealth of things um, that they need and no one agency can do it. So when, when we look at the key challenges for this, um, now I'm doing this at a, at a local level, this was introduced right across the country. So the good thing is now all agencies use the same risk indicator checklist. And so we're all singing from the same hymn book when we look at risk in domestic abuse. So the challenge was really, the, certainly within the locality, was um, getting all agencies on board uh, to be fully trained and actually work with it. So we're all, we all are singing from the same hymn book and that is now working. There are some new things uh, around risk coming in, and one is from Dr. Jane Munton Smith, uh, which they call a timeline to murder. Um, Alex, if anyone... sorry, Susan, sorry to jump in. Just for the sake of time, I would like to, if we could swiftly jump onto the next one, and then we could include yeah. anything else to be yeah. added to the meeting notes. That, that is the, 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 the last bit to do now. So basically key challenge training and um, moving forward, we obviously want to um, impact on people's lives and be able to support them. And this triage is vital to do that. 
Thank you, Susan. Thank you for that insightful presentation. Um, so we'll swiftly be going on to our last presenter for the day, who's Evie Economy. So he's the Development Manager at Bristol Wool Centre. She's going to be talking about how they ensure communities of need are prioritised through outreach and community partnerships. So over to you, Evie. Amazing. Thank you so uh, much for inviting me to join the discussion today. Um, it's really nice to be able to share some of the ways that we're working at the Law Centre. Um, we use triage in a range of ways, but I'll focus on how triage uh, and outreach overlap in one of our projects. Um, I think it's quite a common way of working. It's already been mentioned today. Um, and I know that lots of people in this call will work in this way already, but we found it to be a really effective uh, way of allowing us to work with a particularly hard to reach group. So the project um, that we've been running for about a year now is a collaboration with St Mungo's and it's funded by the local authority in Bristol. Um, it's specifically focused on providing immigration advice to migrants who are homeless and rough sleeping. Um, and then we at the Law Centre will be providing the legal support to help in regard to the immigration status. Um, we hope that this then provides options to individuals like access to benefits that will ultimately help individual migrants to be able to move on from rough sleeping. Um, so I guess by virtue of the project scope, we've already prioritised a specific group of people that we wanted to dedicate specific capacity to. Um, but the triage element of the project is essentially twofold. So um, we have a link worker that is based the same Mungo's. Um, as part of their role, they'll be identifying suitable people for the project um, that they would like us to take uh, their cases on. Um, they might also receive inquiries directly from service users and also from the wider outreach team, and then they'll be able to direct them to the triage sessions. Um, and the triage sessions themselves, they're run at the St Mungo's Day Centre in Bristol, um, and that's where help seekers can attend and speak directly to the lead caseworker um, of the project. It's intended to not be overly formal, and I guess the point is to make people feel as comfortable as possible um, and it's a really important relationship between these roles having the legal caseworker and then also the link worker um, that might hold the uh, sort of day-to-day -day relationship with the individuals. Um, it keeps the triage process feeling quite dynamic and person-centred and I guess creates space to decide what is best for each person based on where they're at. So some people might be ready for us to take on their case and engaging in the process straight away. Um, other times maybe a, a bit more work is needed and that's the kind of work that we can plan and uh, with a link worker and that they can lead on um, up until the point that they're ready to refer the case to uh, our legal team. Um, and in terms of how it's going so far, it feels like a, a good setup for us. Uh, we're able to make the most of the limited casework capacity that we have and also working to the strengths of each organisation in the partnership. Um, it was quite important for us, I think, when we were thinking about how to structure the project that we recognised that the service users that we really wanted to support, they would have been working with outreach workers sometimes for years. Um, so we wanted to sort of build on these relationships rather than starting from scratch. So again, that interplay between the link worker and the legal team is super important. Um, for us in this project. Um, so in terms of the triage aims, um, again, it's assessing a, a, a what stage the, the, the individual is at and how we might be able to progress the case for them. Um, it's really useful to have this sort of embedded process that we can sort of carefully consider um, case selection um, and, and sort of make these tricky decisions about when and how we want to help people through the project um, but yeah essentially is, is looking at uh, are people ready to work with us or do we need to put a plan in place with the link worker for further support so that um, they can engage in the process uh, a bit more easily um, and then in terms of uh, reach and, and uh, being helpful um, for the triage, I guess the 
main reason that we've been wanting to sort of uh, locate our trio sessions in a in a place that feels comfortable for for the people that we're trying to reach is to uh, ensure that we have meaningful engagement. It's uh, I think really important, especially when working with this very particularly vulnerable group um, whose circumstances might be quite precarious and it's something we've tried to be quite sensitive to. Um, uh, so yeah, being in a place that is familiar um, uh, has been really important to, to build that trust with each individual that we are supporting um, and to sort of break that chain where people have been let down so many times or they've got fears around seeking support and, you know, being a reliable um, and uh, approachable service. Um, in terms of the clients that we've supported already, they've uh, commented on uh, that they've felt grateful that the service sort of exists in a place that they already attend anyway for other reasons. Um, so we've uh, yeah, it's been great for us to have that feedback and, and see the benefit um, of having these regular and, and reliable sessions that, that uh, happen frequently um, at the day centre. And then I guess in terms of operational benefits, um, it, one of the key aims of working in this way is uh, helping maximise our capacity and working efficiently. Um, which then helps us uh, support more people ultimately. Um, we've been able to, as I mentioned before, work to the strength of each organisation, um, which I think has a tangible impact on the quality of support that we can offer. You know, we can dedicate time to what we do best, which is the, uh, the specialist legal support. Um, and then we can work with a link worker who um, knows the service users um, much better than we might do or at least in a different capacity um so that is a super quick run through of how we're sort of using triage and outreach um for this project um that is all i wanted to share thank you yeah, thank you so much thank you so much Evan, for very helpful. and to the rest of our speakers as well thank you for sharing your experiences and expertise in such impactful presentations in case you have any questions for our speakers, please put it in the chat and they will be able to answer it in the chat. Um, any questions that we're not able to answer, we will be able to send in the follow-up meeting follow-up with some answers that our speakers will send across. Um, I will now hand over to Martha for the next session of this next session of the session.